So our parent function is this f of x equals b to the x. The reason it's weird is because that b could be anything. It could be 2 to the x, 3 to the x, 5 to the x. They all have their own parent functions. But if that b value is greater than 1, then it's growth. Okay, so here's what this looks like. There are three points I'm going to ask you to focus on, but we're going to look at four for right now. So the first point that we're going to look at is negative one. What happens if I do something like b raised to the negative one power? So if I plug negative one in for x, what happens when I do b to a negative power? What does it do? It's not negative. What does it do to it? Remember, it flips it. Remember, a negative exponent moves it to the bottom. So it becomes 1 over b to the first. We don't typically write that b to the first. We just say it's 1 over b. 0. If I plug in 0, what is b to the 0 power? 1. Anything to the 0 power is 1. That's the best point that we have. Then... If I do b to the first power, what happens if I raise something to the first power? What do I get? Itself, right? 2 to the first, 2. 3 to the first, 3. So b to the first is just b. You guys, these are the most important points that we have. So you need to know and understand this. It's always a nice bonus to look at the second point which would be b squared, but not as necessary. Okay, we're gonna label this graph, but we're gonna label it a little bit weird. I'm gonna call this one. And then I'm gonna call another point b. I don't know where B is. B could be just above one. B could be below one. We don't really know. B could be two, B could be five, B could be 87. We don't know what B is. It could be. Now, if, could be, it's not usually one. If B is there, then way down here, I also have a point that we're gonna label as one over B. So if b was 5, then that would be the point 1 fifth. If b was 87, that would be the point 187. When I look at this graph, this graph looks like this. Negative 1, let's label these as well, negative 1 and positive 1. If I label negative 1, Negative 1 is the point 1 over b. So negative 1, 1 over b, I have this point down here. 0, 1, I have a point at 0, 1. 1, b, I have a point at b. And if we were to go, keep going at 2, which I didn't even give you a point for 2, but if we went to 2, I'd be at b squared. Where is b squared? I don't know, probably up here somewhere. Now talk to me about this. Jack? Curvy. It is curvy. But is there any point in time? Before you answer, think about it. Is there any number down here that I can plug in to b to the x and have it turn negative? b to some power, is there some power I can raise b to and make it negative? Why not, Jack? Okay, let's say we plug in negative 1,000. I would get b to the negative 1,000 power. What does a negative exponent do? Moves it to the bottom, right? So really I just have one over b to the thousandth. Is that zero? Really close, but is it zero? No. Is it negative? No. If I plug in b to the negative one millionth, I would just get one over b to the millionth. I still don't have something negative. 
So this graph does curve and it never actually touches that x-axis. And that brings me to something that we want to talk about. We have something in math that we call asymptotes. We haven't really talked about asymptotes much. We did a little bit with rational. Um, when we dealt with rational exponents, do you remember doing the irrational functions? Did we do the vertical asymptotes? Is that already, or did that happen? I know we did it in algebra one, but now I can't remember when we do it here. Um, this is what we refer to as a horizontal asymptote. Asymptote is spelled A-S-Y-M-P-T-O-T-E, asymptote. And what an asymptote is, is it's a line that the graph tends towards. It's like a magnet being drawn to something magnetic, right? Picture a magnet being a graph and a, and a refrigerator, not a stainless steel one, refrigerator being that asymptote. What's happening is that graph is getting closer and closer to it. It's like pulling it towards it, but it will not cross it. Okay. So let's talk domain and range because our asymptote actually helps us with our range quite a bit. So our domain, You'll like the domain. All reals. Is there anything that we can't plug into this? No, because I can plug in negative numbers. I just get a tiny number. I can plug in huge positive numbers. I can plug in fractions. I can plug in whatever I want. I just get uglier numbers, that's all. Now my range is actually based on the horizontal asymptote and my range is in this case, y is greater than zero. Whatever that horizontal asymptote is happens to be my range. And if you want to write it um, as zero to infinity, that works as well. Okay. Here's one thing I would like you to write down on your paper that I didn't write down. Does this look familiar? Yeah. It's H, actually. Okay. You guys, the transformations are the same. When we start these problems, the first thing I want you to do when we start these problems is I want you to focus on this B to the X first. B to the X is what we want to focus on first. Okay. Then I'm going to deal with next comes the A. And once we deal with the B and the A, then we move to the H and the K. Can I walk you through some examples? Great. I can tell you're excited. All right. So my B to the X in this case is just 2 to the X. This is basically the parent function with a B of 2. Now, according to the table up above, when I plug in negative one, it will be one over the B value. What is that in my case? It'd be one over two. So one over B is one over two because the B value in this case is two. If I substitute in zero, I get one. And if I plug in one, I get two. When I sketch a graph of this, we're really only going to focus on those three points. So my first point at negative one is at one half. 
You guys, that's not very big. Zero is one. One is two. Now the problem is the way this graph looks right now kind of looks like a horizontal or like a line. But it's not a line. If you need more points, plug in more points. What happens if I plugged in two? What would we get? Four, because two squared is four. If I plugged in three, what would I get? Eight. You, you squared it the wrong. If I plugged in four, I'd get 16. If I plugged in five, I'd get 32, which is not on my graph. You can see that this graph is not, in fact, a line. It definitely is curved. So when I sketch this graph, watch me carefully. When I sketch this graph, I do not want to indicate that I'm going to go down below the x-axis. So my graph is going to level out. Because in fact, I have a horizontal asymptote here at y equals 0. y equals 0. That horizontal line y equals 0. Couple things, the three points I'm focused on are these three points right here. But the rest of the graph helps me get a good picture of what's going on in this graph. Domain, what is it? Range. Y is greater than zero. So that's what the parent function looks like. So the rest of the graphs that we're going to look at are going to be based on that parent function. So here's what we're going to do. On this next one, I'm just going to scoot this over a smidge. On this next one, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to start with the parent function. So the parent function that we're going to start with is this 2 to the x. Meaning I already know those values. I know it's going to be 1 half, 1 half, 1, and 2. That's what my parent function would look like. Maybe I sketch a graph, maybe I don't. The second step that I'm going to do I am now going to multiply each y value by the a value. In my case, I'm going to multiply everything by 3. I'm starting with the parent function. The parent function that I started with was the negative 1, 1 half, 0, 1, 1, 2. Then I'm going to take and multiply everything by 3. Multiplying by 3, I get 3 halves. Oops, let's use a pen. 3 halves, 3, and 6. What I'm going to graph Graph the x with the new y. So I'm going to graph negative 1 with 3 halves. Well, 3 halves is like 1 and a half. 0 with 3. And 1 with 6. Oops. I don't know what just happened. Now, what this looks like is it still can't go. Why is it? It's not supposed to sense my hand. Ah. Is it doing it on the screen, too? No. Not doing anything weird? Oh, yeah. Three halves is one and a half. When I sketch this graph, this graph just goes up much quicker than our other graph. So multiplying by an A of three makes the graph go up a lot quicker. But guess what didn't change? My horizontal asymptote didn't change. It's still at zero. So my domain, still all reals. My range is still y is greater than zero.
we were to write um, zero to, to infinity, infinity, totally fine. Okay. Hundred percent perfect. I actually like that better. Okay, what do you, if you were to make a guess on this next graph with this 3 times 2 raised to the x plus 1, if you were to make a guess as to what happens here, what would you say? The graph did what, Jack? Does it just go to the left one and then stretch by the graph? Okay, we have the stretch by 3. That's that A value that we have here. Jack thinks this plus one is going to make the graph go which direction? Do you guys agree? Why? Right. We know that this formula is A times B raised to the X minus H. And we know every other parent function we've dealt with, when we have that minus H, it shifts it left and right. So this is going to shift my graph left one. Now the order I'm going to go in, and I've already done this, so I'm not going to take too much time to do it, is I'm going to start with my parent function. I'm going to start with the one half, one, two. So I'm going to start with the one over B, the one, and the B. Then I'm going to multiply it by three. Now we've already done this, so we already know the results of this. And I get 3 halves, 3, and 6. I am going to still plot these points. So I'm still going to plot negative 1, 3 halves, 0, 3, 1, 6. Those are the same three points we just graphed in the one above it. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each of those points that I just plotted and I'm going to shift them left one. Shifting left one, does it impact my horizontal asymptote? No, I didn't shift my graph up or down any. So my domain and my range are still, whoops, my domain and my range are still all reals, and y is greater than 0 or 0 to infinity. So we've just taken this function that we graphed before and shifted it left 1. So if you were to make a guess as to this fourth one, what do you think would happen? Up 1 and left 1. Up 1 from this graph, right? So we take our original parent function of 2 to the x, we multiply it by 3, so we stretch it by 3, we shift it left 1, up 1. Try it. See what you get. I'm going to start with that parent function. And I would do the left one, up one, all at one time. Is, it's just you were outside, I think. All right. When we sketch this one, the trickiest part about this one is actually none of the, the left one, up one, the stretch by three. That's not the problem. It's remembering that when we shift it up one, guess what else moves up? The range. The range, the asymptote. 
So that horizontal asymptote is now no longer at zero. Shifting it left and right doesn't impact it any because it is already moving left to right. But if I ask the whole graph to shift up one, so too does the horizontal asymptote. So, like so go ahead. You said it goes up three, it would be up the, three. It goes up three. Yep. So then this would go from three, three to infinity. Three. Yep. That's the beauty of, of these is that vertical shift is my range. Where it's shifted to becomes my range. So if we're going up three, my range is from three to infinity. Down three, negative three to infinity. Questions on graphing exponential growth? I'm sure there's not just yet. I'm sure you'll come up with some. But let's go on to modeling with exponential growth. Um, I actually think that exponential growth and exponential decay are the some of the most useful um, formulas you'll use because everything we deal with in like from loans to retirement accounts to um, I don't even know population all deals with exponential growth or decay. Okay. We already said from the front page, we said that exponential functions fit this pattern. We said they fit the pattern y equals a times b to the x. You don't necessarily need to write that down. I just want to remind you that's what the front said. You can. It won't hurt to write it down. Now, when we model exponential growth... This stays the same. What's going to look a little bit different is the B value. B, remember, is our growth factor, not our percent of growth. So to model exponential growth, we're going to replace B with 1 plus R. R is the percent of growth as a decimal. So if we say it's 5% growth, it would be point R would be 0 0.05. If we say R is 20% growth, R would be 0.2. Okay? That B value, this one plus the R becomes my growth factor. Okay, so let's look at how we set this up. You could be given a problem like this. You invest $1,000 in an account that pays 5% interest per year. Simple interest. Yeah, right. Good luck. I would like you to find 5% for me. Um, it used to be a thing, though, but it's not anymore. Um, you have an account that pays 5% interest in simple interest. We're going to talk about other forms of interest later. I want to be able to write a model, and I want that model to be able to use to predict how much I will have in the account in six years, assuming I don't touch anything. Grandma gives you $1,000. You put it in a bank account and don't touch it for six years. How much do you have? Okay. So first thing, first thing we need to know about is what we call our initial condition, our initial amount, our A value. This A value is referred to as our initial condition. Sometimes you will hear it referred to as your principal. The principal amount, the initial amount you put in, and now I'm thinking it might be LE. I can't remember. Nope, it's AL. Okay, 5%. When we change 5% to a decimal, what is 5% changed to as a decimal? 0 0.05. So when we change this to a decimal, this becomes 0 0.05. My R value is 0 0.05. So when I set up the model, I'm just rewriting the problem. 
We typically use T instead of X because oftentimes when we're dealing with modeling exponential growth or decay, it is in time. I can't think of any reason exponential growth, real world problems would be anything but time. Number of bacteria growing in a culture, that would be time. Um, interest rate or population, time. Everything is time. So we typically use T. All right, here's what this looks like. Y equals A, our initial amount, times 1 plus R, our interest rate, as a decimal, raised to the T power. This is what we call our model. Now, you could see the model written this way. You could also see it simplified, and I'm okay you doing it either way, because we know what 1 plus 0 0.05 is. We know it's 1.05. <coughs> so you could see your model this way. Now, let's talk about a few things. This fits that pattern, right? A times B to an exponent. That fits that pattern. Two, what did we say growth had to be? The B value has to be what? Greater than, one. greater than 1. Is the B value greater than 1? Not by much, but it is greater than 1. This is my exponential model that models growth. Now, if I want to figure out how much is going to be the account in six years, we're going to do 1,000 times 1 1.05 to the sixth power. Now, given that most of us, myself included, have no idea what 1.05 to the sixth power is, you're going to need a calculator. You can type it straight in your calculator, just like this, 1,000 parentheses, 1 1.05 parentheses to the sixth power. And since we're dealing with money, what do we get? 1,940.095. Well, we're dealing with money, so let's, they're n banks are never going to round up in your favor, just so you know. No, they just cut it off. They call it, they call it good. All right, a couple things. When we start talking about compound interest, it's one of my favorite topics because it's so fascinating to watch how money grows or money can grow or how money can accumulate and not in a good way. Let's say your grandma gave you $1,000 and you could find a bank that paid 5% interest and you put it in there and you didn't touch it for six years. So like when most of you are leaving college. Now, did you make, are you a millionaire? No, but just by leaving your money in there, you earned $340.09 free. No work, nothing, yeah. Because of um, like inflation or deflation or whatever, that's not a lot of money, it's like, it hasn't well. I'm not saying you're going to be wealthy from this $1,000. Well, like, the bank usually has that interest because your money, if you don't... No, don't get me wrong. The bank gave you this much because they made like 5 million times more than that. They're giving you, they're not generous. They're giving you tiny amounts. I promise you, I assure you, the bank is making more money than you are on your $1,000. That's, that's the beauty and detriment of compound interest, which we'll talk about compound interest, which is a little different than simple interest. Most car loans, um, most car loans are what we call simple interest. So it's not accumulated over time quite the same way as say a house loan, which we call amortized. It's a little bit different. So we'll look at that. All right. I want you to try one. Try writing the model and determining the population. pretty big because like no <laughs> okay 
Okay, let's talk the first thing. 1.2% change to a decimal is what? 0 0.012. Remember, the decimal place moves two units to the left. So this is my model. Be good at writing the model in addition to just plugging in the numbers because I will ask you for the model. And now I'm doing it for 15 years, so I'm plugging that in. What do we get? Now we're dealing with the population, so I wouldn't do any decimals. How many times have you seen a fraction of a person? No. Are they still a person? Even if they're missing their limbs. Yes. Even if they are a baby, they are still a person. They are still a body. Can't just give a decimal. That's not a thing. Not in population. All right. How do we do? Good. Good. 